Hello everyone and welcome to the series about uh, data mining. This is part 5 and it's about MongoDB. Um, in many cases you don't have to go and collect data because you have uh, data in a local uh, NoSQL database that requires analysis. This could be um, URL uh, audit trail for from uh, your website uh, where you want to study visitors and trends for example. Um, one common uh, NoSQL database is, uh, Mongo, is uh, MongoDB. Uh, which is the subject of this tutorial. We'll be talking about uh, why do we use um, NoSQL, common no NoSQL uh, database systems, um, PyMongo, which is uh, a Python uh, driver for MongoDB, uh, single uh, documents with nested documents, and working with multiple documents. So uh, let's start with uh, why do we use uh, NoSQL. Uh, NoSQL was designed to deal with the problems that came up when uh, developers started dealing with large uh, amount of uh, large amounts of uh, data using existing relational database, also uh, referred to as SQL database. Um, the three main issues with the SQL uh, databases were changing um, schema. During the lifetime of your um, application, you will change schema. You will need some kind of um, um, new field or um, doing something with your uh, database schema. Um, so um, uh, SQL databases had fixed schema of uh, tables, which limited the ability to store new fields in your table. You had to change the table schema uh, whenever you need a new field, basically. Uh, the volume of data in storage, um, SQL databases can store virtually billions of records in a single table, but the problem was the overhead cost of your CPU and memory to be able to access this data efficiently. Um, you usually will need um, a very professional kind of um, a server or cluster to be able to do that, and it's not... Um, um, really um, cheap to do that uh, with a um, SQL database. The frequency of adding new data. Um, SQL databases are not designed to insert large amounts of um, records uh, in short time, especially to large tables, and especially if you have um, uh, relations to other tables, and these tables are also large. You'll have to do um, so many reads um, to check all um, primary keys and other tables to ensure that uh, you're keeping the integrity of the um, uh, relationship. Uh, so what did uh, NoSQL uh, do to overcome these uh, issues? Um, for the changing schema, they used a document-based archive, uh, at l or at least document-based archives, NoSQL, use a JSON-like format to store um, rows in a collection. Um, this allows collections to store data in uh, any schema without changing the database. So um, by storing each um, uh, document uh, in its own format, you're basically um, allowing for um, virtually changing um, your um, data in an unlimited way, basically. Um, NoSQL uh, databases use um, different, uh, different distributed clustering systems to store data in multiple machines and distribute the processing power over multiple machines. Um, this uh, is how to deal with large amounts of uh, data. They're basically using commodity hardware uh, over multiple machines to do a distributed system of um, uh, distributed system for your database, for your NoSQL database. Uh, they're basically using some kind of shredding of um, collections to uh, spread the data over multiple machines that ensures uh, sometimes uh, um, faster operation because multiple machines are doing the work uh, together and it ensures uh, that you won't lose your data if one of your machines f um, fails because they're usually using um, some kind of fault tolerant uh, distribution where any server cannot, uh, no one piece of uh, information is stored uh, in a single uh, server. It has to be on multiple servers. Uh, so uh, MongoDB uses a grid uh, file system and some other famous systems use Hadoop, for example. Um, to do this uh, distributed computing uh, process. Uh, NoSQL um, dropped 
the support for relational um, database, basically. So this is how they're dealing with the frequency of adding new data, uh, which requires multiple read operation to, ensures, uh, to ensure um, primary key integrity in the relationship. Um, this has reduced the cost of storing new data to simply just writing the data on the disk and generating a primary key in some systems. Not all systems generate primary key as they're storing data in um, your database. Um, common NoSQL uh, databases, uh, MongoDB, which is the subject of this uh, tutorial. Uh, it's, it comes from the word uh, humongous. It's a cross-platform, document-oriented uh, database. Um, classified as NoSQL database, Mongo um, issues uh, the um, traditional uh, um, table-based relation uh, database structure in favor of JSON-like document with dynamic schema. So this is how they're dealing with the um, dynamic schema issue. It's an Apache, It's uh, it comes under um, uh, GNU or Apache license. Uh, it's um, free and open source software. Um, the second one is uh, Apache Cassandra. Uh, Apache Cassandra is an open source distributed um, database system. Uh, the main difference between MongoDB and uh, Apache and the next one, which is uh, HBase, is if you're starting with um, NoSQL and you want to uh, get a feel of uh, NoSQL, you will basically use MongoDB or CouchDB, which are the easier two to implement. Um, Cassandra is um, um, the main difference between Cassandra and the uh, and HBase and the other two is the amount of data that you can store. Um, they're all virtually unlimited, um, but uh, Cassandra had uh, proven to be more. Um, reliable with larger amounts of data. Uh, HBase is also um, meet, uh, uh, HBase also meets that um, criteria. Um, uh, Cassandra, um, uh, HBase basically is the um, uh, same thing. It was modeled after Google's uh, Big Table and it's written in uh, Java. It uses Hadoop, a distributed um, file system to um, um, operate to store data and uh, do processing. Um, finally, CouchDB, it's very similar to Mongo. Um, but um, to me, uh, and it's much easier, by the way, but to me, the main difference between them is uh, CouchDB does not generate primary keys as it stores data. It generates them as it you request data back. Um, so you there is no consistent primary key for your um, records. Uh, you might request data, request it uh, in a different way, and you will get a different index for the same record. Um, if you're using um, uh, Amazon Web Services or Google uh, Cloud, you might be interested in a managed service from them. Uh, Amazon has um, Amazon uh, DynamoDB. And uh, Google has a um, data store. They're both NoSQL uh, database systems, and they're managed, so you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. Um, other options is using uh, MySQL cluster. So you might already have MySQL cluster. Um, it might be interesting to you to know that it has NoSQL support. Uh, although it's uh, limited uh, NoSQL support, but it still does. Um, PyMongo, uh, this is the uh, link to uh, PyMongo documentation if you're interested. Uh, so let's start by importing the library. Uh, import PyMongo. I will um, connect to my uh, local machine, uh, create a connection to my local machine. Uh, you can connect to another machine if you just change the host and port, where you can connect to a different machine, basically. Um, so... Um, since I'm uh, connected to my local machine already, I can list all available uh, databases in my uh, local uh, system. Um, I have um, four databases in here. Um, I can uh, list available connections uh, or collections, sorry, inside the Russian uh, database. And I can see that there is system that indexes. This is a system generated um, collection, so you don't have to worry about that. 
uh, but um, the rest of them contain some kind of um, social uh, media archives from Twitter and YouTube. Um, I will be connecting to um, Twitter collection. So I'm retrieving uh, the collection from the database. Um, first thing I can do is count how many uh, documents I have there. And it shows that I have uh, 1,045,260 records or documents inside that uh, collection. To find a single document or retrieve it, a single document, you can just use uh, find one. This will return the first document you have in your collection. Um, you can pass um, filters inside a, a dictionary to um, filter out which document you want. But if we uh, pass no um, arguments there, it will just return the first um, document that we have in our collection. Um, we can uh, notice that um, our document is uh, a dictionary object. Um, the first uh, feel, uh, the first attribute we have there is underscore ID, and it's an object ID. This is basically your primary key. Um, so let's examine um, this uh, document a little further. Let's start with the uh, object ID. Um, object ID is very interesting. This is the documentation for object ID if you're interested in knowing more. But uh, it's um, um, built um, out of uh, multiple um, variables, including the machine that generated it, the process ID, and um, um, other parts, actually. Um, so if we uh, retrieve our um, uh, object ID and uh, print the type of it and return it back, um, we'll uh, get the type of uh, base in that object ID, that object ID, uh, this is the class object ID basically. And uh, when we return it, we'll see the uh, key that it has inside our, our ID basically. Um, one thing we can uh, retrieve from this uh, object ID is the time this uh, document was generated. So we can retrieve that document ID, that generation time. And I'm just formatting this time in um, ISO format. Um, you can see that it was generated in 2014 and the time zone was UTC. Um, uh, to access uh, other fields, you can just um, access them like you're accessing any attributes in inside a um, dictionary. Uh, so created that, it's um, Unicode um, uh, object. Uh, the text inside of that tweet is also a Unicode object. One trick um, about uh, Unicode, if you want to display the Unicode um, characters instead of this kind of code, you can just print it. So if I print um, this text, it will uh, um, print out the actual um, uh, Unicode um, uh, text that um, um, that you need to see. Uh, this is this trick works perfectly for IPython uh, notebooks, and it comes in very handy sometimes. Uh, anyway, um, nested documents we can notice in our document um, the one we retrieved that we have user, which is a not a single value; it's um, dictionary basically. So it's a dictionary. Um, as a value for an attribute inside our main uh, dictionary. So we can uh, retrieve um, user. If we retrieve that, we'll see that we have a dictionary with all user um, uh, information. We can access a um, sub-attribute of the main um, uh, of this uh, nested document like this, so user, that very uh, user, then uh, we're accessing verified. So we can retrieve the value of whether the user is uh, verified or not. And it returns false. Um, one trick um, about Unicode, once you're dealing with dictionaries, so you'll have a lot of, um, when you have a lot of uh, Unicode inside the dictionary and you want to display it in IPython notebook, you can uh, print out the Unicode uh, with this function. Basically, I'm um, um, 
iterating over all the items of this uh, dictionary and returning the key and value and printing them. So I can see that I have my URL links working and I get uh, my Unicode uh, printed correctly. Um, finding multiple documents. Um, the way um, this works is um, by using the function find instead of find one. This will return multiple documents. Uh, and I'm passing in here a um, criteria or a filter to this um, find um, method. So um, the um, criteria I'm using is user that verified. So I want it to go into user um, attribute and check the um, sub attribute of that um, um, of that uh, or the of this uh, nested document. And I wanted to make sure it's a verified user. So I want to basically return all the tweets of the verified users in my one million tweets. Um, one thing we can do is count them. Uh, we have 672 uh, messages from verified users. Um, the thing I want to do is I want to loop over all the messages and return only the user data. I don't care about the tweet itself. I just want to check the, um, uh, get back the user's data. Um, and it, I stored that in a data frame to make uh, the, uh, to make processing this uh, easier. Uh, I'll filter out all the um, duplicate um, users. Basically, if a user sent multiple tweets and his ID showed up more than once, basically. So I'm dropping uh, all duplicates using uh, ID. And I can see that um, we have only 222 uh, unique users in these um, 672 um, tweets. Um, the thing I want to do in here, I'm uh, scattering um, the followers count, so how many followers they have with how many tweets they uh, sent to see if there is a relation. And I'm using um, for uh, color map or C map um, the friends count, so how many people they are following. Um, I'm printing that on a um, log scale for X and Y. The thing we can notice in here that almost everyone has less than 15,000 followers. Uh, we can see that only few people have more than that. One, two, maybe. Uh, and there's a third one here. Um, so most of the verified users do, do not follow a lot of people. That's one thing we can notice. Uh, and we can see there is some kind of a relation in here, a linear relation. The more you tweet, the more followers you have, basically. Um, and that's what we can do with that. And uh, you can um, feel free to uh, explore more data in your environment and um, uh, if you have any questions you can leave them in the comments uh, below um, this uh, tutorial is available open source on uh, github and it's viewable on MB Viewer. Uh, feel free to use it for any purpose that you have um, thank you for watching and I hope if you watch uh, if you like this you will subscribe to this channel and you will watch the previous part about uh, Google um, search data mining google search or the next part about data mining um twitter streaming api thank you for watching and i hope to see you next time